Let's welcome Professor Mike Mota. Well, thank you, Shoshan, for that wonderful invitation. I thank the Vietnamese, who I assume are over in this part of the hall, for the wonderful hospitality that you have shared with me and all of the other members of the audience over the last few days. I assume that the Chinese, my Chinese friends are over here, and the Korean and Japanese and Filipino and Thai and other friends are scattered around. The So the, I'm a biologist at the University of Minnesota who is interested in the interaction of pathogens with pigs and how it affects their health and how pigs respond to resist infection. So this is basically immunology and the knowledge we generate studying immunity we feel can be applied to vaccinology, applied immunology for the development of tools that will improve animal health. Part of biology is variation. You've heard a lot about variation from Dr. Pietre and Dr. Gillespie, and this is something that will come up time and again. It it's, can be difficult to grasp because every time you look at things, you see that they're not quite the same as they were before. So it, it can be hard to deal with, but you have to. So here we're looking at the people who do the work. I'm very proud to have a number of wonderful graduate students and other personnel. Uh, Shishan Yuan was one of the, the early students and more have followed in his footsteps. A lot of our work is dependent on collaboration with people who have special knowledge and expertise and the ability to find sponsors who are interested in the knowledge that we generate. <clears throat> so what I hope to do today is talk to you about the variation in the, ho in, in the virus. When you look at PERS and pig interactions, it's crucial to understand that PERS describes this enormous variety of viruses, enormous genetic variation that translates into biological variation, variation in pathology, presents challenges in achieving protection when you use vaccine tools that represent a single genotype of virus. Globally, PERS viruses characterized as type 1 viruses originally discovered and most common in Europe and Type 2 viruses discovered initially most common in North America and then spread to Asia. And I describe type 2 viruses as the virulent viruses of Asia. But remember now, there's enormous variation within each type and then they're vastly different one from another, about 45% nucleotide sequence variation. So I believe, and I think I will show you with some of the data in the presentation, that type 2 viruses are the key problem in, in Asia as in North America because they grow to higher levels in pigs. They clearly have higher virulence in the respiratory disease in growing animals. They clearly have more severe reproductive disease and they clearly are readily transmitted in high hog dense regions by airborne transmission. There are reports of finding PERS virus, type 1 PERS virus in air outside of infected barns in Europe. But to demonstrate transmission basically has never been done to my knowledge. So in this enormous, so, so one of the questions in Asia is what is the diversity of viruses that you're trying to manage with tools like vaccination? And this is a figure that shows 
if we look at all of the type 1 viruses over here, just this little group represents subtype 1 or the Lelystat-like viruses, Lelystat being the first virus, PERS virus discovered. So all of these viruses actually belong just to this small group, and they're characterized by, have, by not being transmitted by air, by having low levels of virulence and low levels of disease. In contrast to type 2 viruses, there's much more variation in those viruses in Asia. So I want to show you some of the published data looking for, not, not asking initially here what the total variation is in different regions of Asia, but just can you find type 1 virus? We know there's a lot of type 2. But if you look, here's a study from 2009 in Thailand where the, they reported first virus isolates found in 2001 were close to type 2 viruses, but the type 1 viruses were related to Lelystad virus. In fact, they looked like direct descendants. They were so close. In Korea, again, paper reported in 2009, the type 1 viruses in Korea were subtype 1. Again, the Lelystad virus Lung lesion scores range from 0%, in other words, no histopathology at all, to 35% involvement among infected pigs. A more recent study had the same report, low levels of lung lesions, no mortality observed. Okay. Type 1 viruses have been reported more recently in China. And it's not hugely surprising. This is a report in northern China, I think, from two different field cases with mild in one or no clinical signs in the other. So this is actually not that unusual an observation in Europe as well, where these subtype 1 viruses are found in herds, but they only tend to cause disease in late gestation sows. Here is some of the small or only examples in Asia of a general survey saying what is the diversity of viruses, type 1 and type 2, in a region, in this case here in Vietnam, where you sequence everything you find. And they found that almost all of the viruses were North American or type 2 shown here. They found in one location, Ho Chi Minh City, two type 1 viruses. And these, in fact, were in a herd that also had type 2 viruses. So I, I will show you some data later on that uh, where people have gone, where unpublished data on virus diversity has been, sh has been shared with us in, in the U.S., and I will, at the end of my talk, make a couple comments about the opportunity there is in Asia if people share their unpublished data to get a good handle on the variation in viruses on farms in Asia. Oops, okay, here. So, and this is an example comparing genetic diversity in PERS virus in the U.S. Uh, with data in Asia. None of this data is in GenBank. You cannot find it. It was shared with a group of us from the records over 17 years of virus collection from five large U.S. swine producers. In the U.S., basically, every time you have a PERS outbreak, you sequence or five. The system maintains a database so they can try and understand where the virus came from. If you put this into a dendrogram, these 6,774 sequences, you can see these are all type 2 viruses, and there are, some, there are a number of different families which differ by 5 to 10 percent 
each from each other. And over here are the type 1 viruses, which comprise less than 2% of the total. Yes, we have type 1 PERS virus in the U.S. No one cares because the key disease type virus is type 2, and immunity generated against type 2 apparently controls or the virus itself outcompetes type 1 viruses because rarely are they maintained in herds. So we keep talking about how virulent type 2 viruses are, but it's important to understand that if that information is generated in research laboratories, it may or may not apply to what you see in the field. Experimental animals are maintained in high health. Disease severity may be particularly severe. and in terms of controlling diseases in the field, you need to know what is going on in the field. Here are some data from the field on high path PERS in Shandong, China, uh, reported in 2009. And if you do not pay attention to the vaccine results, just, con just concentrate on morbidity and mortality in the face of an outbreak with no treatment. Nearly all the animals are morbid, one-third of them die. Backyard pigs, you see the same story. High levels of morbidity, high levels of mortality. So these viruses, this is not 0 to 35% lung lesions with no clinical signs. This is pigs dying. Similarly, in northeast China and in another farm in northern China, we see high levels of morbidity, substantial mortality, increased days to market. And in different production systems from this study, again, you see variation in mortality from 15% to more than 60%. So these are tremendously pathogenic viruses. Okay. So if you have PERS is a problem, and we saw from Dr. Pietre that the negative consequences in terms of sustainability and profitability when diseases strike, if you are, do not have control measures in place. We see in Vietnam over the past 15 years or so that total pigs produced, pig numbers, are more or less stable, but the pig meat production has been, has been increasing steadily. And the goal here is to continue to increase pig meat produced per, per pig raised. And one way to do that is to increase the health status of the animals. And this matters particularly here because in Asia, if you can sell a pig, you have the highest return on investment. Here we're looking at South Korea, at Vietnam and China are the three countries in this survey that comes out every month uh, of, of the maximum uh, net revenue on your animals. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about immunity to PERS. I want to just say briefly a little bit about new findings in, in immunity to PERS and then talk about how that might translate to vaccines. I'm, I'm frankly kind of tired of coming to meetings year after year after year and showing viremia curves and showing ELISA antibody and serum and showing that we cannot measure cell-mediated immunity. And wanted to just let you know here that we've recently discovered that you can, that contrary to what we previously knew, you can find high titers of broadly neutralizing antibodies in sows. That here is some evidence. Again, two different herds, 20 animals in the red curve, 14 animals looking at mean and standard errors of neutralizing titers where instead of the typical one to four or one to eight that is commonly reported, we're seeing average titers from all the animals of 1 to 50 to 1 to 100. Okay. 
And I want to point out that this is not homologous virus titers, this is cross-neutralizing antibodies. These herds were infected with wild-type viruses that are substantially different from the virus used in the assay by about 15%. So cross-neutralization. Okay. We refer to these as broadly neutralizing the antibodies because we see neutralizing activity across a range of different virus types. Type 2 viruses, well-known 184, highly virulent in the U.S., and different, different viruses, genetically different. To our surprise, the highest neutralizing titers were obtained to type 1 viruses. So we are finding conditions now in pigs in the field that are able to induce antibody responses in these animals that appear to be able to neutralize virtually all, vir all PERS viruses known. Okay. We know that anti-PERS virus immunity is complete, as shown by Dr. Gillespie earlier, with a similar slide, only with more information on it, that herd closure or load close homogenize this procedure that was not developed by scientists, it was developed by veterinarians in the U.S. trying to control PERS. They found out that if you fill a pig full of gilts and sow, fill a pig, I said that yesterday too, you fill a barn with gilts and sows to maintain production for a period of nine months, you vaccinate all of the animals, immunize them so they have immunity, and do not let any naive animals in that could possibly get infected, if you wait 250 or 270 days and open up the barn, there is no virus. You bring in animals, they do not become infected. This is convincing evidence to me that the immune system of the pig can completely get rid of the virus. It says that immune-based approaches, vaccination-based tools, can be made to work better, to give, even, to give better protection than, that, than they do today, to reduce the time in which virus is maintained in pigs. Okay. So, vaccines, what does that mean? There are lots and lots of vaccines. This is a list that was made a few years ago when talking with a friend at, in, in Europe we tried to identify all the vaccines that were known, and there were about 25 or 26 on this list. I was told that there are this many vaccines in Vietnam today. And if you go to China, I'll ask Yan, Dr. Yan Han Chun here, the list probably starts here, goes down here, goes across the floor and up the back wall. There are many, many, many vaccines. So. What do you, so, so are they all the same? No. A lot of these vaccines, it's not that they don't work, they're no good, they're just no good. So what different, and we know that there are some vaccines that are efficacious. So we're interested in what the properties are of good vaccines. So this is my summary of the qualities that you need to have in a PERS virus vaccine material to expect that it will provide some protection. It has to be a virus that replicates in the pig. It needs to be attenuated so it's safe, but it, it, if it doesn't replicate, if it's killed or a subunit product, I'm telling you it will not protect. It has to be safe, so it needs to be attenuated. There is a practice in the United States of using live virus inoculation. We actually saw some data from Dr. Gillespie. These, these are not safe. You're maintaining a virulent virus in your herd. And if, you're, if you want to define safety, you should use a late gestation sow model as your test because this is the animal that's most sensitive to the disease aspects of PERS viruses. It has to be cross-protective. All vaccine viruses are single isolates that you're asking to provide 
cross protection against the entire diversity of PERS viruses. And it's important to recognize, as we again heard this morning, that you need good technical support. You're not being asked to immunize a pig to protect it against PERS. You're being asked to immunize a barn with 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 sows in it or the similar number of finishers so that there's no disease anywhere in the barn. Anim there's turnover, so animals come in and go out all the time. So how do you develop a strategy so that you maintain solid immunity throughout the entire herd? It's not a trivial question. <coughs> okay. Well, live attenuated PERS viruses used as vaccines induce an immunity that provides cross protection. One of the features of live virus immunity in, per, in PERS, in pigs, is that it, there is cross protection. And this example uses, compares to protection using high path PERS as a model. There are a few vir PERS viruses out there more virulent than high path PERS. I do not know of any of them. But here we see that if animals are immunized beforehand, 100% survival. If they're not protected by vaccination, we see over a period of about two weeks that mortality kills about two-thirds of the pigs. Survive, well, it is exactly two-thirds. The survival was four out of 12 pigs in this experiment. The clinical signs, substantial reduction from no vaccine to vaccine. We see here again that Current vaccines are not 100% effective, but they substantially reduce disease severity. This reduction in disease severity has been demonstrated many, many times. Dr. Gillespie showed data from 22 studies earlier. Some of those studies are in this list as well. So we're looking at protection with one particular vaccine afforded to a range of viruses which are not different at all to 14% different in sequence variation. And in all cases, there's substantial reduction in lung lesions. Okay. So these vaccines really do provide protection in experimental settings. But we want to ask if we see the same kind of protection in field settings because we know in PERS that it can be challenging to generate immunity in the field. It's more difficult than what you can find in the laboratory. The, but before we look at that, since I forgot what slide is coming next, we, I want to provide some evidence to support my statement that killed vaccines and, and subunit vaccines do not provide protection. And this is one example of several publications in the field, in the, in the literature. This comes from a type one PERS virus study. Failure of an inactivated vaccine to protect guilts against a heterologous challenge with PERS virus. Killed vaccines, and I have seen data myself many times, killed vaccines are not effective. Subunit vaccines are not effective. Another nice, the title of this paper from Spain completely describes the conclusions of the study. Not only does it not protect, it may enhance clinical disease. The same results were obtained in the US in a type two challenge model for reasons we do not understand. If you immunize pigs with recombinant GP5 protein, major envelope glycoprotein, they're sicker when you give them a virulent virus challenge. Okay. Now we can look at some field data that is most relevant to the situation in Asia, asking if vaccines applied under standard field conditions in Asia provide protection against PERS. 
And this is the vaccine data that uh, from this study in Shandong province where live attenuated vaccine reduced mortality from 32% to 9%, reduced morbidity substantially. And similarly, the same the study we showed previously in Northeast China, substantial reduction in morbidity, substantial reduction in mortality, grow finish mortality down and days to market faster. And then the final study we'll look at here, vaccination, tremendous reduction in mortality in all cases down to less than 10%. So, uh, so these are single examples where you have an outbreak, you intervene with a vaccine and something happens, something good happens. Okay. Can you maintain that protection you get with the vaccine? And so to answer that question, I show you this study, which was carried out over a period of more than five years in a very large system in the US where each dot is the result of a group of pigs going into a nursery, raised up to be taken out of the nursery, and they counted the pigs when they took them out of the nursery, they had fewer pigs because some had died. And over a period of two years, 7.5% of, on average, of the pigs were dying. You can see variation. Sometimes it was 15%, sometimes it was 3.5%. But on average, 7.5%. It took them two years to think that maybe they could do better. Uh, maybe corn prices were very low. Maybe they thought their return on investment was OK. But finally, they, they vaccinate, and you see a very rapid decrease in mortality that was sustained for two years in time, where they, they now vaccinated every group before it went into the nursery. So there's really sustained improvement in pig health, sustained improvement in production parameters when you vaccinate in an environment where PERS virus is present. So I asked the question here, what else do you see in that data? No, don't look down at the bottom. <clears throat> there are people who might tell you that vaccines will revert to virulence. No, that would be a bad thing. And they might induce an antibody response of low neutralizing activity that will enhance infection. That's what ADE is. Or you might put a pressure on the virulent viruses to escape the vaccine immunity, and so you'd end up with something worse. And I'm telling you, there is no reversion to virulence here. You see no increase in, in mortality. There is no antibody-dependent enhancement. Things are better. They're not worse. There are no escape mutants that are resistant to vaccination. So I, to me, this is compelling evidence there are more than 360,000 animals coming out of the nursery over this period of time. That's the strongest data I think you will ever see that a modified live vaccine is safe. Okay. So, PERS modified live vaccines are wonderful, okay? But they have limitations. They do not replace sanitation. They do not replace genetics. And they do not replace good animal care. You know, for any vaccine that you want to control any disease, that you want to use it in animals where you're doing everything you can to make them as healthy as possible and to provide an opportunity for vaccines to induce robust immunity that will protect against specific pathogens. So that's the other limitation of vaccines for PERS. They only work for PERS. Dr. Gillespie showed a nice differential chart of the clinical signs of PERS 
and showed that there are a whole lot of, whole long list of other pathogens that, that produced a lot of the same clinical signs. So how do you know that when you have a problem, it's being caused by PERS? And I cannot emphasize how important diagnostics are. I urge you to demand high quality diagnostics from the people who provide you with assessments of health and provide you with information about what the pathogens are in your farm that may be causing disease. Okay. And on vaccines, I want to make one final point here based on data. <clears throat> The nature of pig farming is that there's a variety of pathogens. <clears throat> there's enteric pathogens, reproductive pathogens, systemic pathogens, respiratory pathogens. And the respiratory pathogens in particular can really reduce productivity. And here we're looking at some economic data generated by various investigators and, and veterinarians in the U.S where they're looking at this is the cost of disease. And these two examples are from mycoplasma work. And this third one is mycoplasma, okay, where if you use a single vaccine against mycoplasma, the difference between vaccinated and non-vaccinated is small. Okay? So there's a cost to mycoplasma. There's a cost if you get swine influenza. There's a bigger cost if you get PERS. But what's really remarkable is how much more it costs to have any two. MHIO with influenza or with PERS or PERS and influenza together. So this is, <clears throat> there's, there's no real science here. There's, there's, I think, a clear, obvious conclusion that if you're trying to provide the best health and production opportunities for your animals. Vaccines that protect against two or three diseases in common, for example, respiratory diseases, you can obtain substantially more benefit than if you just have one. So normally this is a time when you throw out, you know, the big conclusions. And it seemed to me, you know, we have a diverse audience here. There's a lot of variation. Variation is one of the themes, I think, that has emerged today. <clears throat> we have a number of scientists in the audience. We have veterinarians. We have producers. And the take-home messages, I think, are, are distinct. So for the producer and the veterinarian, in my opinion, type 2 PERS viruses are predominant through Asia, and they also are the cause of PERS disease. They're the significant pathogen compared to type 1 viruses. You know, since I cannot read Vietnam Vietnamese, I will turn back here. Live attenuated type 2 vaccines, so vaccines that are ab attenuated viruses able to replicate in a pig provide cross-protective immunity. And this immunity extends to highly virulent viruses like HPPERS in China, as well as to highly virulent type 2 viruses in other regions of the world. PERS immunity reduces disease significantly, but we have not obtained yet the perfect vaccine that completely eliminates. So here, if your expectation is that using a vaccine will make your problem go away, you will be disappointed because that does not happen. But our goal as scientists and veterinarians is to figure out how to stimulate the pig's immune, immune system by vaccination to work better than it does currently. PERS increases the economic impact of other swine diseases. So if you have other pathogens in the farm, you need to apply treatment tools that will manage those pathogens as well as PERS. Combinations of effective vaccines are effective together. There is no negative effect 
immunologically of putting in more antigens. The immune system is perfectly able to respond to all of the antigens of PERS virus and all of the antigens of mycoplasma hyonemonia at the same time. And I'm careful about how I said that because that's very different than taking two bottles of vaccine and mixing them together. The adjuvant in a typical mycoplasma vaccine material will likely inactivate the PERS virus. And if the PERS virus is inactivated, it will not work. So if it takes a lot of experimental studies to find out how you can mix things together so they all work. Oops. Oh. Yeah. So lessons for the scientist. So I use myself as the example of the scientist and I see things that I need to do to help the swine industry. PERS is a disease of commercial pigs. Studying PERS in the laboratory really does not translate very well to the field. So translating laboratory research to the field is essential. What that means for me is most of my research now is done in collaboration with producers in the field. So we don't have to find something and then figure out if we see the same thing in the field. So this collaboration is important because it's the people in the field who have the good questions. They can see what the problems are. They know the problems better than I do. And what's going on is relevant to local conditions. I spent years studying reproductive purrs in clean sows. And, and it took a while to, of being told to realize that in the field, sows are not naive negative animals. They're already immune to purrs. And an immune sow is very different from a non-immune sow. Yan Han Chun here is agreeing that for a long time I was doing research it was not really addressing the problem. Thank you so much, doctor. Oh, oh you, you, you should. Uh, why did you encourage him? Oh. Molecular epidemiology is a key to understanding PERS transmission. We have a very diverse group of viruses here, and the more you know about the virus, the more you know about how to control it, the more you know where it came from. High quality immunology research is the foundation of good vaccine development. So the scientists who are working trying to make good vaccines, that means understand the principles of immunity to PERS virus and use that as a basis for going forward. And the goal of the research is to improve swine health and productivity. So think about PERS and the big picture of swine health and swine production. And lastly, I want to re-emphasize this point of working together. Bob Morrison at the University of Minnesota started the Swine Health Monitoring Project about three years ago where he talked producers into sharing their information and he then shares it with the entire world. So if you go to the website shown here, you can pull down weekly reports come out every Friday and have for at least two years now reporting new information every week on PERS, on PEDV, on coronavirus enteric diseases, and most recently on Seneca Valley virus, which emerged in the U.S. this past summer. And these producers are willing to have their names appear here. These are all of the producers in the U.S. who are sharing their data. Now, that they also are now sharing PERS virus nucleic acid sequences. They have been accumulating this information for almost 20 years, and it's, no one has access to it until now. And the first dendrogram we put together looks like no other dendrogram I have ever seen for PERS virus. We normally make a dendrogram that just shows all the things that are really different. 
So you do not know what the population really looks like. And I'll point out here, you heard about the 174 strain of viruses that are causing a lot of problems in the U.S. now. That's this group where you see the red dot. There's this long line of about 180 sequences that we do not see any little things sticking up because they're almost all the same sequence. Over a period of nine months, we've seen essentially no significant divergence. And we see that, the repeating pattern. Here's a, an early, we, we, we see a number of these examples where substantial outbreaks were occurring, and during the time of the outbreak, the variation, the viruses were not changing very much. And you see that they do not go on forever. In all of these cases, after a year or two years in a particular system, the virus would disappear because the tools of management and vaccination are actually very good for getting rid of PERS. These farms that had 174 virus in 2014 and 15 did not have the virus before then. It was like PEDV, it got in and particularly virulent, transmits very well for reasons we do not understand. But if you implement in conditions of good pig health and good biosecurity and appropriate use of vaccine tools, you can control these diseases. But you have to be ready because this showed up in 2014. Some of these others showed up in 2005, 2007, and so on. But if we have producers, veterinarians, scientists working together, you know, find common ground, which reminds me. And I know you do not just have high path purrs in Asia. I've seen dendrograms from big swine producers printed on paper that if you hold it up, it's a list of viruses that would go down to the floor and the genetic diversity is the same as we see here. The 184 family, the 144s. High path PERS is a 142. All of these RFLP types we throw around. But, the, but you need to have that information to understand how big the problem is with PERS in Asia and in all the countries of Asia. And then you're better prepared to figure out how to manage it. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.